Hello and welcome to another episode of the Realm of Unknown. I'm your host Shane and before we get into today's topic I just want to preface real quick by saying that the audio might be a bit strange in this episode and that is due to me actually being out in the woods right now. <laughs> um, yeah, when all this self-isolation stuff has to be going on, recording episodes for a podcast is sort of hard to do when you're living with other people. So I have to improvise a little bit, and this was the best that I could do while also having a good time with nature. So just as a brief recap, um, this episode today it was actually covered back in late November of last year while we were discussing some of the Philadelphia urban legends and myths. The Philadelphia Experiment, which is the topic of today's episode, was briefly covered and was given a sort of small breakdown of its events, but today the episode is purely based off it and is going to be discussing the full story, the timeline of the events, and sort of how it ended up playing a role sort of within pop culture and modern mythology. So our story centers with the USS Eldridge, a naval destroyer that was freshly commissioned around the time that this event supposedly occurred. And the timeline begins in 1943, either in the late summer or early fall, depending on the sources that you look at. But generally within that time frame, uh, like that turning point of the year. At this point in time, the U.S. had already been in uh, two years of involvement with World War II. And that war was pretty much hitting its apex at this moment. The government, along with other nations, were completely at wartime mode. Um, they were you know, advancing technology, they were building new machines and vehicles, and they were attempting plenty of new experiments, all in hopes to gain the edge over the opposing forces. In this supposed case, the, this opposing force was the devastating and infamous German U-boats which had been giving the U.S. and along with other countries um, a lot of issues with their ships and vessels. Many difficulties during the early years were prominent, and uh, when the U.S. began to get involved, that's when things sort of had to change. So the Philadelphia Experiment, or in some regards Project Rainbow, was one of such attempt to combat the U-boats. This experiment was supposedly conducted in order to help mask a vessel from enemy radar systems, effectively making the ship invisible to enemy combatants. Now, the USS Eldridge was the first line of experimentation. While it was stationed in the Philadelphia Naval Yard, uh, which is located in the southern section of the city, while nestled into the Delaware River. During the day of the experiment, witnesses of the event supposedly watched as an eerie greenish-blue light began to emit from the hull of the ship. Then, before anything could really be done, the ship just spontaneously vanished. Gone into thin air, and there was no explanation as to what happened, or where it went, or when it disappeared. This was until a few hours later, when the USS Eldridge was supposedly spotted down in Virginia within the uh, Norfolk Naval Yard, which is roughly 300 miles away from Philadelphia. Then, just as Suddenly, as it disappeared and reappeared, it did it all over again and popped right back up into the Philadelphia Naval Yard. According to the accounts of the event, members of the crew suffered from horrific burns, nausea, and disorientation. And there were some reports that crew members had their arms and legs infused into the metal and the deck of the ship itself. This is the story of the USS Eldridge and the Philadelphia Experiment. A failed experiment which resulted in the potential accidental teleportation or possibly time travel. What we have discussed so far can essentially be chalked up to a Sparknote version of uh, an essay, and there is a reason for that, as the main event doesn't really have much more information than what I just provided. The real meat of the Philadelphia experiment, however, comes from the how and the who of the story. More specifically, how we learned of it. Uh, and the supposed experimentation, and those who play a role in shaping the dialogue of the story across the next several decades, forming it into what we now know it is today. When it comes to the Philadelphia Experiment, practically all of the information that is known about the story comes from one single man by the name of Carl M. Allen. He also has a pen name known as Carlos Miguel Alande, but... I'm not really going to address him as such because that's not really that 
creative of a pseudonym, so he's just going to be known as Carl Allen. But yes, all the information that we do know about the Philadelphia Experiment comes from Carl himself. As in the year 1956, 13 years after the supposed event took place, he began to send letters out to a man by the name of Morris K. Yesup. So Morris was an author and an amateur astronomer who, a year prior to Carl's letters, wrote and published a book titled The Case for the UFO. This book was self-researched by Morris, and due to this, Carl's letter criticized his understanding of the unified field theory, a topic brought up within the book. The unified field theory is described within physics as a type of field theory that allows all that is usually thought as a fundamental force or element, uh, elementary particle to be written in terms of a pair of physical and virtual fields. Basically, what it boils down to is the relation and interaction of the fundamental pillars and forces uh, that we understand within the universe. These forces being things such as gravity, electromagnetism, and other, other basic particles. Within Carl's letter, he claimed that he had been taught about the unified field theory by none other than Albert Einstein himself, although this theory has never properly been proven to exist, even by Einstein. Nonetheless, this did not stop Carl from attempting to prove to Morris that, he, that such a theory truly does exist, but what sort of evidence does good old Carl provide? Well, none other than his very own eyewitness account of the USS Eldridge's disappearance and subsequent reappearance within the Philadelphia Naval Yard back in 1943. On top of that, despite no other witness, either from the crew or from neighboring boats, regardless of this fact, the story only continued to grow momentum. So after all these claims that Carl was giving him through the letters, Yesup didn't just sit there and do nothing. Rather, he attempted to investigate them, but with little avail. In fact, he got to a point in which he considered dropping the entire search altogether because he wasn't finding anything, until one day in 1957 when he was visited by two officers from the Office of Naval Research. According to an information sheet published by the ONR, there are these two officers who visited Yesup were actually responding to a rather strange package that the Navy received a year prior in 1956. The package contained a copy of Yesup's book, The Case for UFO, which had been annotated with handwritten notes, all claiming advanced knowledge of physics and linking extraterrestrial technologies to breakthroughs in the unified field theory. These notes were written in such a way that it was intended to look as though different people were writing them, possibly three of them. Um, one of them actually was supposedly written in an attempt of an alien language. However, Yesa, being the person he was, an author and researcher himself, almost immediately identified the handwriting as that of Carl Allen and the letters that he personally received. Yesup's part in this story, however, ends rather sadly, as he took his own life uh, two years later in 1959 after some tragedies with, within his life. Now, just a quick little side tangent, it's rather strange, but for some odd reason, the ONR officers themselves, these two that came and visited Yesup, personally took it upon themselves to publish copies of the book with all the annotations and everything. Some sources say that there could be hundreds of these versions, but the ONR information sheet uh, only details about 25 copies being in existence. The officers used a Texas military contractor named Vero Manufacturing, and because of that, these uh, new copies ended up being dubbed the Vero Editions. And they're actually pretty much a collectible at this point when it comes to the conspiracy theory side of things um, in, to this day. So, yes, I'm sort of out of the picture now. He passed away. Um, however, Carl, Carl Allen, he would continue this until his own death in 1994. But during this whole time in between, he would continue to send letters and messages. Pretty much anyone and everyone who would listen to him uh, about his own eyewitness account of what really happened. And it's within this time frame that we sort of get uh, more potential witnesses that step forward about the event. 
So since the original Philadelphia experiment supposedly took place in 1943, Carl Allen had remained the only witness of this allegedly unfolding experiment. He claimed to have been stationed upon the SS Andrew Ferruth, which was a vessel also docked in the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard, and he had a clear view of the Eldridge at the point of disappearance. This fact about Carl being the sole witness would remain pretty much the same thing for several decades after the event supposedly took place, and eventually, however, this would change as the years went by. So many, many years later, a man by the name of Al Balik, he came forward also claiming to have personally taken part in the experiment. However, he had been brainwashed in order to forget every single part of it. This was, however, until 1988, after viewing the 1984 movie named The Philadelphia Experiment, which acted as a trigger for Balak to unlock all these lost memories of his life. So despite this new witness, both Carl and Al's claims were not enough to really solidify the story, especially since many times their stories ended up changing throughout the years. What really did give the story a bump, however, was the emergence of a third testimony a few years later in 1994, the same year that Carl passed away. This testimony came from an astrophysicist and UFOologist, Jacques F. Vallée, who published an article in the Journal of Scientific Exploration titled The Anatomy of a Hoax, the Philadelphia Experiment, 50 Years Later. Valet had written a previous article about the Philadelphia Experiment, and with this uh, previous publication being established with a readership, he asked the readers to, that he reached out to for further information about the alleged event. This was when Valet received a letter from a man named Edward Dugan, who served as part of the U.S. Navy between the years of 1942 and 1945. Dugan had served on the USS Instrum which was in dry dock within the Philadelphia Naval Yard during the year of 1943, at the same time that the supposed event took place with the Eldridge in the same area. Dugan was an electrician within the Navy, and he had knowledge of some of the devices that were being installed upon the USS Enstrom. So Dugan further stated that some devices that were being installed were also the exact same on the El uh, USS Eldridge at the time. Although I couldn't really find any information that stated that the Eldridge was also in dry dock, which was technically how you're supposed to dock in order to do maintenance and repairs as well as installations. However, Dugan continues on by saying that the devices that were installed were far from some sort of teleportation device. He does not really claim that that's what it was. He doesn't think there's any weird connection to Einstein or some secret aliens uh, secrets. Rather, the devices were to enable the ships to scramble their magnetic signature while using a technique known as degaussing. The ships were wrapped in large cables and then these cables were zapped with uh, high voltage charges and a degaussed ship wouldn't technically be invisible, however it would be undetectable by the U-boat's uh, magnetic torpedoes. So Dugan was familiar with the wild rumors about disappearing ships and the mangled crewmen that were supposedly warped into the metal, but he states that this can all be linked back to the sailors' talk of a quote-unquote invisibility to the magnetic torpedoes. He thinks they just word of mouth and trickle down the lane type stuff sort of melded the idea that the ship would become invisible. So as for the green glow, that was possibly due to the, an electronic storm or a St. Elmo's fire, which is a weather phenomena that causes a luminescent plasma to occur on the points of certain ships. As for the Eldridge's mysterious appearance in the Norfolk uh, Naval Yard and then sudden return to Philadelphia, Dugan explained that the Navy uses inland canals that are no like they're off limits to commercial and residential uh, usage. So the Navy actually uses them in order to cut travel down from what could possibly be a two-day trip into a maybe half-day round trip. So to add even more confusion to all these stories and all these new testimonies that are coming out, the Philadelphia Inquirer actually reported in 1999 at a reunion in Atlantic City. And who they reported upon were naval soldiers who actually served on the USS Eldridge. 
These sailors stated that the ship was actually never docked in Philadelphia, and the USS Eldridge was actually up in Brooklyn at the day of the supposed disappearance. In fact, the ship's very own log confirms this timeline of event. Furthermore, the captain stated that no sort of experiments had ever really been conducted on that vessel. And this is sort of where we transition into the Navy's aspect of the story and sort of their own research. So despite these differing accounts with the Eldridge's activity, both Dugan and the ship's crew confirmed that nothing otherworldly actually happened aboard the ship. Furthermore, the uh, Naval Department's library detailed um, uh, detailing of the ONR's information sheet, as well as other internal documents, has or was, I should say, even further illuminated these events, specifically through the Navy's point of view, like I said earlier. The Naval Archives is pretty much what I'm going to be talking about uh, from this point forward, and the Naval Archives continue further by helping to explain away a lot of the foundation of the supposed story and eyewitness accounts. They go into detail on the USS Eldridge's deck log and war diary, stating that the Eldridge's commissioning, um, or I should say starting with the Eldridge's commissioning on August 27th of 1943. So it's being commissioned up there, it's located off the Long Island Sound, and this was up until the 6th of December, or I should say the 6th of September the next year when it sailed down uh, to the Bermudas. So from this point until mid-October, the Eldridge remained in Bermuda in order to conduct training and uh, some sea trials. Then, come October 15th, uh, the ship would sail back to New York, arriving on the 18th. The Eldridge remained in the New York Harbor until the 1st of November, when it became part of the escort for convoy uh, UGS-23. And November 2nd, the convoy entered the Naval Operating Base in Norfolk, Virginia, so it did end up in Norfolk at some point. However, after that, it and the convoy would actually head out to um, Casablanca, Morocco, and it would arrive there on November 22nd. Once more, it would leave for another escort, this being the convoy uh, GUS-22. And it would arrive along with the convoy in the New York Harbor on the 17th of December. So once again, it remained in New York for a pretty decent amount of time. It essentially stayed there until the year wrapped up. Again, it was commissioned in August, and then it ended up back there in December. And it stayed there until pretty much the end of the year. It didn't leave again until January, and that means 1943 has now wrapped up, and it has never actually entered Philadelphia. As for the supposed witness of the Philadelphia experiment by the crew members of a nearby ship, it was determined that the supposed ship, the SS Andrew Ferruth, which Carl Allen claims that he was on when the supposed, you know, disappearance and stuff happened, and the sudden arrival of the Eldridge in Norfolk sort of has a skewed accuracy to it. The U, or I should say, the SS Andrew Ferruth's movements and uh, record cards list that the merchant ship's port of call, the date and the arrival, and the convoy's destination. So they were able to get that and sort of determine all the information about where the ship was and when it was, and sort of if it has any sort of connection to the Eldridge. So between August of 1943 and January of 1944. The movement record card of the Andrew Ferruth, in comparison to the USS Eldridge's own records, detailed that neither ship ever were in Norfolk at the exact same time. They never actually crossed paths during this time frame. That's another thing about the story that doesn't really hold any ground. Also mentioned earlier in this episode, the Philadelphia Experiment uh, allegedly went by the title Project Rainbow. However, once more, if you were to search the Naval Archives, there is no record of a Project Rainbow, and especially relating to any sort of teleportation or making a ship disappear. However, during the 1940s, the codename Rainbow was used, and this was primarily in reference to the Rome, Berlin, and Tokyo axis. And this Rainbow plans were actually the war plans created in order to defeat Italy, Germany, and Japan during you guessed it, World War II. The ONR report goes on to discuss uh, the mentioning of degaussing, which was the supposed you know, connection and how to make all this stuff invisible. 
However, degaussing is a process in which a system of electrical cables are installed around the circumference of a ship's hull. These cables, you know, run up and down from both sides from bow to stern and a measured electrical charge or current is passed through these cables in order to cancel out the ship's own magnetic field. So degaussing equipment was, in, uh, was installed onto the hull of naval ships, and this could be turned on you know, pretty much whenever the ship was in water. And this was primarily only used in order to combat magnetic mines, which were pretty much only in shallow waters and combative areas. So it was a very selective thing to use, and they only really used it when they had to take care of mines that were underneath the ship. It could be said, however, um, that degaussing done correctly makes a ship quote-unquote invisible to the sensors of these mines, but the ship itself remains completely visible to the human eye, to enemy radars, and especially to underwater listening devices, so you don't just disappear off of all equipment. It's a very specific, specific targeted usage. Conclusively, after several years of conducting research and investigations, the staff of the Naval Archives, along with many more independent researchers like myself, I wish I wouldn't go that far, but in this specific case, they were not able to find any official documents that support the claim that the Navy actually experimented with invisibility or teleportation, especially having it take place in Philadelphia, and pretty much across the board, it never took place. So that sort of wraps up the section with pretty much simple research being able to disprove the structure surrounding the experiment. And it sort of wraps up the discussion. Overall, there's no new information that really came out about the story. Again, Carl Allen passed away in 1994, and he was really the driving voice behind keeping this story alive. Even so, if one were to just do simple research into the matter, then you would discover that a lot of discrepancies arrive with the original account. That being said, the Philadelphia Experiment does still remain as a rather key focus with a lot of conspiracy theories, and it has sort of cemented itself into science fiction as well. But that's pretty much all my research. Um, <laughs> I hope you guys did enjoy this little deep dive. It's pretty much, I think, our first conspiracy theory type thing. If you did enjoy it, please let me know because it was a lot of fun to look into. And uh, it's a sort of a simpler one, definitely not one of the larger ones that are out there. Those could easily take up two episodes on its own. But yeah, so that's it for today. If you guys would want to stay up to date, I know a lot of things are going on right now in the world and it's a sort of a crazy time. So if you want to stay up to date on how things are kind of going with the podcast and sort of the schedule and stuff, be sure to check out Twitter and Instagram at Realm of Unknown because I will be uploading more and more there. And if you do want to help support the podcast in any way, I know, again, it's sort of like a weird financial time. So Patreon is an option, but I, if you guys are having struggles, don't. Please focus on yourself. Focus on your family. However, that being said... <laughs> Leaving a review is really, really helpful, uh, not only just because it helps with sort of the, I guess, algorithms of these podcast hosting places, but um, it does help a lot with me sort of understanding what I need to do to help further improve the podcast and what people are enjoying and what people are not enjoying. So if you could leave a review at like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, that sort of place, it'd be greatly appreciated. And remember, guys, please stay spooky, please stay safe, and I shall see you guys all again next time.